Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to Unique Ways with Thomas Gerard, an audio podcast. We have a notable guest on today. He's a huge advocate for the design community and is a regular speaker at international conferences like South by Southwest, Awards, and The Next Web. He founded and curated Deconstruct, UX London, and leading design conferences, as well as an online community of over 2,000 design leaders. He's a founding member of the Adobe Design Circle and has appeared on both the Wired 100 and BIMO 100 lists, as well as winning Agency of the Year several times. Please join me in welcoming Andy Budd. Welcome. Hey, hey there, everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in and listening, and thanks for inter uh, inviting me, uh, Thomas. No, no worries. You ready for 20 questions? I am certainly am. Well, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm ready. We'll see. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give it a go. Great. Okay. Number one, tell me a little bit more about yourself. What do you do? Well, at the moment, I split my time between doing two things work-wise. Um, I spend two days a week coaching design and product leaders, so heads, directors, and VPs of design. I've got about a dozen or so people that I work with. Um, they might be anything from a relatively kind of newly minted design leader, you know, maybe leading a team of sort of four or five people, up to you know VPs and SVPs of design that might be leading teams of a of a hundred or so. So I help them, you know, manage and, and work their way through the challenges of being a design leader. Um, on the other side of the coin, I spend two days as a partner in a venture capital fund. So I'm a VP, a, a venture partner at Seacamp. We're one of the first and, and generally regarded as one of the best um, European pre-seed funds. And so I spend a lot of my time helping founders get their product to you know a, a, a reasonable stage to product market fit, which obviously is a big um, design challenge in part. And then help them build their business, build their pipeline, and um, you know grow and, and 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 sort of prosper. So those are two things I'm doing at the moment, uh, work wise, I guess. Great. Okay. Um, and if you're interested in these uh, episodes around VPs of design, um, definitely check out the episode with Rajiv Vanderheed. He was a great um, guest and lighting designer. Um, so number two, what's a key piece of knowledge that makes you different? Um, I don't think I have a particularly key piece of knowledge that makes me different. Um, but I do, as you would imagine, strongly believe in the power of design. I think um, even to this day, it really amazes me that people still see design as purely the visual manifestation of a a piece of work, an interface, a, you know, a building, a you know, a, a physical product. But as you and your your audience will know, design is much more about um, understanding problems and assembling and solving solutions and assembling them in interesting novel um, ways in order to deliver value and, and solve problems. And so. I guess most of my career has been around trying to help unlocking the power of design. And I've done that, you know, with my coaching clients by helping them communicate the value of design to their bosses. I've done that through all the conferences you mentioned, trying to help all of our attendees, trying to um, unlock the power of design. And it's also why I got into uh, the VC world, because I realized that, um, it's much better to try and get first stage, kind of early stage founders to appreciate design on day one, um, because then when they grow their team, they're going to naturally have an affinity to hiring designers and solving that problem. Whereas if you don't help them figure that stuff out in the early stages, it's often too late, you know, later on down the line to really sort of change their mind. And so, yeah, the power of design, I think, is my uh, um not piece of secret knowledge because I want it to get, you know, I, I want people to realize, you know, the power more, but I guess that's where I sort of put my effort. Great. Okay. Um, number three, why this of all things, why do you do what you do? Well, I mean, I guess I, I guess I sort of um, explain that slightly. I mean, why I do design in general is um, I, I mean, obviously it's, it's, when you start as an IC, an individual con contributor, it's a very, very rewarding role. Like back in the day when I started in the digital space, um, I'm old enough that I remember being, you know, a web um, master or a web designer where you do some back end, some front end, a bit of design. And I guess I got the most 
immediate satisfaction from the design side of things. When you're doing code, it, it's an interesting kind of challenging engineering problem to solve, but also there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of bug hunting. There's a lot of reading obscure documentation and, you know, things, you know, I, ne I never got on with regex. I never got on with like SQL. Um, and then I just kind of design and design was really about understanding human behavior. You know, I've always been interested in psychology. I've always particularly interested in behavioral psychology and behavioral economics. And so trying to solve problems with the human in mind has always been a, a passion. I think I, like many people, um, have experienced really badly designed interfaces, you know, whether you're trying to buy a train ticket on an automated machine or whether you're trying to book, you know, concert tickets online or whatever. I've always been really frustrated about how the human is very rarely considered in the mix. And so I have found it a, a, a constant source of fascination about how we can build things um, with with people in mind. And so I guess that's sort of how and why I got into this this field and why I enjoy it so much. Great, that's great. Um, number four, some people struggle with, but the question is, what does your future look like? So what does my future look like? That is a really interesting question, and I don't know. I mean, I, I'm i sadly not a, 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 a soothsayer or a fortune teller. Um, sadly, I don't have the um, the Back to the Future book of um, sports almanac, so I can't look into the future and, and kind of tell you what's going to happen on that sense. Um, but I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing at the moment. I mean, I've always been somebody that kind of lives in the now. Um, and I don't mean that in a kind of pretentious way, but I mean, a lot of people particularly through my coaching, who are very, very sort of concerned about what's happened in the past, you know, and they sort of obsess, they they run over conversations, they wish they'd done something differently. And, and, and that fact that they couldn't do things differently often kind of eats away at them. I've never been somebody who kind of worries too much about the past because it's gone now and you can't really do anything about it. What you can obviously do is change your behavior in the future. But at the same time, you know, um the future you know is 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 yet to manifest you know you can spend some time looking at um planning your next steps and your next routes and again that's a lot of what i do with some of my coaching clients as well is trying to f help um my coaching clients figure out what their next steps are but weirdly i think because a lot of my my um time is spent serving others i don't really spend an awful lot of time um, considering my future, but that's partly because I'm quite satisfied. I think a lot of the time people are looking for a better future because there's something that's missing now. You know, maybe if they're a bit more kind of, you know, not materialistic, but maybe some people material comfort's really important. And so they're constantly wanting to get a better job, a well-paid job, live in a better house, you know, these kind of more material based improvements. And so there's often a drive there. Other people kind of, you know, understandably in jobs that don't serve them or satisfy them. I think I'm really lucky in that I enjoy the VC work. I enjoy the coaching work. I enjoy my quality of life. And so there's not really anything um, I'm looking to do that I haven't kind of done. So I guess I'm sort of quite comfortable. And I think my future is going to be looking relatively similar to where I am now. I've kind of tried to manufacture the life that I want. Um, again, not in a kind of a fluffy kind of, you know, East Coast or sorry, West Coast way. But yeah, I'm just kind of contented. So I don't have to spend an awful lot of time wishing I was somewhere else or doing something else. Super. Um, number five, we say is unique to this show. And the question is, let's talk about location. How does the notion of place play into what you do? Um. On some level, I'd say that it doesn't. I mean, one of the things that always really excited me about the internet is to some sense it's stateless and placeless. Or at the very least, if you're looking at the internet as a place, it's a place in and of itself. And so I've always been quite, you know, um, into internet culture. I've always been quite into the shrinking effect that the internet has. And I think the internet has developed its own sort of sense of place to some extent. And hopefully I've been paid a small part in creating that. I would say that the internet has a, a, a bias. It has a Western bias. It has an English language bias. It has an American cultural bias. And so 
Um, I think you can see the thumbprints of kind of like Western culture all over the internet, but I think you can see that in music and, um, you know, paintings and TV shows as well. So I, I do think that the internet has brought everyone closer together, but that closeness has also meant a, um, a merging of, of, distinct cultures into a single kind of you know global culture and internet culture um you see this all the time when you travel around the world you go to different coffee shops around the world but a lot of them have a similar um a similar look a similar feel uh, so I, I think there is an internationalization in you know in, in what i do at the same time you know i'm i'm very british i have a very british mindset and outlook in life um you know, I, I often find when I'm talking to Americans, you know, there's a joke around British and Americans are, are divided by a common language. Um, often I'll be saying things that the, that the other person on the conversation isn't just getting and vice versa. And so I think I am very much of my location. I think I'm very much of my culture. Um, you know, I start pretty much every conversation with a, you know, when someone says, hey, how's it going? I'll be like, you know, talking about the weather. You know, it's a cliche. I sit and drink tea a lot of the time. Um I'm generally polite and, you know, um, don't like to make a fuss in restaurants. You know, a lot of my, a lot of my kind of cultural behaviors are very kind of European and, um, and, and British in terms of my design sensibilities. I think, um, the UK and Europe particularly have got a really strong design culture. They've got a strong focus on typography. They've got a strong focus on user needs. There's no, you know, no surprise that the, um, um, uh, sort of a service design, world emerge from Europe. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of my approach to design is very European in nature. Perfect. And six is if you had to start from the beginning, what advice would you give your former younger self? I probably would not give myself any advice. Um, again, going back to what I said earlier about the past and the future, like I'm pretty comfortable and happy with the journey I've been on. I'm not sure I would listen to myself anyway. Um, and I'm not sure I've got anything that would be, you know, particularly insightful for the younger me that I would kind of like take on board and would change things. Like I can't imagine being any different from where I am now. And because I'm not lacking anything particularly, I'm not sure that there's like, oh, if only I'd have said X, Y, Z. Obviously, there's a bit of a, you know, there are, are some trite answer to that which is like you know for probably about 10 years i kept on telling myself oh i should buy some apple stock and then every time i looked it's like, oh the apple stock is really high i could never imagine it ever going higher and then next year went higher and next year went higher and next year went higher i think maybe buy some apple stock whenever you you know whenever you've been given the opportunity would be sensible from a financial perspective i probably now would say the same thing with nvidia you know for the last five or six years i've been thinking oh like it'd be quite good to buy nvidia stock um and then I never do because it's always expensive and then it massively goes up. Um, I also think that maybe, I think this is just not about me, but I think it's a lot about general designers. I think a lot of designers can be quite ivory tower um, and, and theoretical and conceptual and, and fighting for the power of design in its purity when they're younger. And that can get really frustrating for the people around you, your bosses, your managers, your executives. And so I would probably um, suggest to most designers that they um, spend more time understanding the context of the business they're working in, spend more time understanding the, the way that your business makes money, spend more time understanding the, the needs and goals of your business partners. But I think that is just more broad general advice rather than anything I'd give to myself specifically. Um, but uh but yeah, I'm I'm pretty content, so I don't think there's anything that I would uh, add to that. Okay, perfect. And seven, what's a day in your life like? A day in my life these days is sort of mostly hopping on video calls. I mean, I, I live in a town called Brighton. We're by the sea. Um, so often I'll start by going and having a walk down the, the seafront, get some light in my eyes, get a bit of exercise, get to see the ocean, which is always quite nice. Um Sadly, Brighton doesn't have beautiful sandy beaches. They're kind of like pebbly. And because Brighton's in the UK, it kind of it doesn't have the California weather. So it's kind of a bit cold and drizzly at times. But it's really, really nice to get outside and start the day that way. Um, I um, you know, get up, you know, 6.30ish. I'll, you know, have 
you know, probably three or four cups of tea before I'll even start working because I'm a tea addict. Um, I'll have a, a, a nice solid breakfast and then I'll be hopping on calls. And, you know, um, if it's a coaching day, I'll be talking to three or four design leaders um, and helping them kind of navigate the challenges they're facing. If it's a startup day, I'll be doing the same and hopping on three or four calls with design founders, you know, people we've invested in and helping them figure out and solve the problems they're facing. Um, sometimes I'm involved, you know, maybe once or twice a week, I'm involved in pitches. So a startup founder will come and pitch to the, the team and I'll sit on a pitch and ask some questions and try and figure out whether the idea they're presenting feels like it would be a good investment for the company. Um, sometimes I will do things like, you know, podcasts or, or public speaking. Um, but yeah, most of my time these days is, is hopping in and out of uh, Zoom chats. Perfect. And eight is around lifelong learning. It's a popular topic. How do you stay up to date? Well, um, that is an interesting one. Like I, I've always been a sort of a fan of social media. I was quite an early Twitter user. And for the longest time, I found that Twitter was a really, really good tool for bubbling up useful content. When all of my other design friends were on Twitter, people would be sharing things they've discovered. You know, for a while, I'd say that Twitter kind of overtook RSS and blog reading, um, you know, when Twitter came out, because previously you'd you'd follow 20 or 30 blogs, 20 or 30 publications, you'd syndicate that through RSS, and you'd have a kind of a fire hose of content. Whereas... I think when the emergence of social media came and particularly Twitter, you ended up using your social graph as a tool for curating your feed and and and, and being exposed to new ideas. Um, I still do that a little bit, but obviously Twitter's gone to a slightly darker, um, less positive place. A lot of my friends, even though I still have an account on Twitter and I still dip in and dip out, a lot of my friends have moved to other platforms, whether it's, you know, Macedon, Blue Sky or Threads. And so I guess my ability to bubble up new content is a little bit harder. Obviously, at the same time, though, we've seen a, a maybe partly because of it, we've seen an explosion of newsletters. And so I guess I like most people, I've got a I've got a fairly healthy and um, quite large media diet. I'm constantly being fed more stuff than I can read. But you know, because my um, my day is quite broken up with lots of calls, I can pop in and read a couple of articles here, read a couple of articles there, and generally stay on top of what um, what is going on in the kind of like the design and the tech news cycle. Um, I don't think anybody ever feels like they're completely up to date, but I think I'm quite lucky. You know, I don't like my day job isn't like focusing from nine to five on a particular problem weeks and weeks at a time a lot of the designers i know they can only kind of keep up to date with things um outside of office hours so i'm quite lucky that you know i don't smoke you know rather than taking a smoke break you know or, or a social media break i'll just dive into my you know backlog of unwritten articles so un unread articles um you know i've got lots of browser tabs open i've got lots of you know pdfs of books um so yeah just constant grazing to try and uh, keep up with what's going on. Great. And nine tools to use with both digital and analog tools. Um, I'm not really a, much of an analog person. Um, I, you know, I, I sort of envy people that carry a, a moleskin around and, and take judicious, judicious notes. I'm also sort of envious of people that have got some kind of, you know, clever prioritization system where at the end of the day or at the beginning of the next day they write out all of the things they want to achieve and they achieve them um i'm pretty pretty you know digital and also pretty old school i mean i think what tends to happen with most people is they they build a tech stack around them and then they invest time into adding content to that tech stack <laughs> excuse me and eventually that tech stack becomes so full of data that it becomes hard to move so you know i use you know my email is still you know maybe that's quite old school but my email is still a big part of my uh um management platform it's my to-do list it's my you know my my crm my my you know my way of keeping in touch with people 
Um, obviously, I use other tools like WhatsApp and Telegram, but I say email is still the, the easiest way to get hold of me. Um, WhatsApp, Telegram and other kind of instant messaging tools are more of a stream. And with that stream mentality, things, you know, are ephemeral and they disappear. Whereas my email is still an inbox that, I, you know, if you email me, you're going to get an answer or at least you're going to know that I've seen it. I kind of follow an inbox zero approach. So my inbox is pretty tidy. Um, so, you know, that, that keeps things pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, I keep a lot of notes in just Apple notes. I know that's, again, it's, it's, it's not kind of cool or, or an exciting piece of technology, but for a lot of my, um, coaching calls, I just make notes in Apple notes. Um, I've also got a big, um, you know, for anything that's, that's more that I want to kind of pull out later, I use Evernote. Again, Evernote's rubbish. I've I've wanted to move over to other tools like Bear, um, you know, or, or Obsidian or what have you, plenty of times. But the problem is I've got so much data in in Evernote that actually moving that all over and categorizing it and tagging it is a real pain. So yeah, you know, and I guess in terms of writing, you know, again, I wish, you know, a lot of my friends use lovely little you know, tools like AI Writer or, you know, um, you know, you know, there's lots of lovely little kind of no distraction writing tools out there, but I just end up using Google Docs. So, um, you know, Notion and Airtable and all those kind of things. So my my tool stack is pretty predictable, I have to say. Perfect. And halfway number 10, how do you deal with work-life balance? Oh, I, actually, I missed oh. one. Sorry. Hmm. Hold up. Number nine. Uh, no, no, that's right. Number 10, how do you deal with work-life balance? Um, I don't think that work-life balance is something I necessarily have to deal with. Um, I mean, I guess a lot of people have very, very separate work lives and social lives. And the two need to have some rigidity between them. Um, and a lot of people worry and stress and, you know, if they get an email late at night, maybe that stress will build up and they won't be able to sleep or, you know, maybe it will kind of burst out into uncomfortable habits or, you know, um, bad sleep patterns or whatever. So I can understand why a lot of people, um, need to kind of put hard boundaries on, I guess my work life and my social life kind of Mondays to go a little bit you know I was a I was a founder of a company for 15 years um as a founder of a company you are usually the um the last stop in a chain of of escalation and so if something's broken something goes wrong you need to make yourself available so I've got very comfortable with you know being available if something's really really genuinely on fire to fix it um if you're blocking somebody and it means that they're having to deal with something that's unfair um you know, it's not fair on them. So I think being a leader, you kind of need to create time in your life to do that. At the same time, um, if it's not earning it, but, you know, urgent, if it's not burning and on fire, I'm quite happy to leave things. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll you know, sometimes do a triage of emails, you know, while the adverts are on on TV or while I'm waiting for the kettle to boil. And if there's some things I can get you know, done really quickly, I'll get them done. And if not, I'll just file them away and do them later. So I guess my work and my my regular life kind of blur into each other, but they blur into each other in a comfortable um, uh, sort of, yeah, in a sort of a, a comfortable, non-invasive, non-intrusive, problematic way. Um so, yeah, I, I, I don't really have an I, I answer of how I've done that beyond just, you know, like you have, you know, you have control over what you do and where you put your focus. Um, and um, I, I try to, you know, to have a relatively balanced life. I'm not a workaholic, um, but at the same time, I'm I'm respectful of other people's time. and I'm respectful of my own time. Great. OK, I'm excited for number 11. If you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? Well, I mean, I guess there's there's a, a bunch of different ways to answer that. Technically, I mean, I I, I you know, I, I discovered um the internet. I discovered the internet while I was traveling around the world, actually, um, in cyber cafes in Thailand and Indonesia. Um and you know, discovered how to build websites through that process as well. And so um if I hadn't discovered that, 
I might have been on the track I trained to be on, which was um, possibly aviation um, or aeronautical engineering. I did a bit of flying as a kid. Um, I studied aeronautical engineering at university. And, you know, I might have ended up going into the aeronautical industry as a as some kind of engineer, some kind of aircraft designer, or who knows, maybe some kind of pilot. Um, but I'm sort of glad I didn't do that because the internet and you know web design was a lot more rewarding. And, and frankly, um, I got into it at exactly the right time when everything was blowing up. Um, if I was to, for whatever reason, go back in time, knowing what I knew now, and I had to, whatever weird reason, pick a different career. Um, I would probably still be doing something in the creative world, architecture. Um, you know, there's a there's a long history of of overlap between architecture and, and digital design. A lot of the early um, uh, information architects, you know, use their language from from architecture. You know, pattern language, you know, comes from architecture. Um, you know, shearing layers, you know, all that kind of sort of stuff that we use, you know, bl blueprints, wireframing. Um, and I love modern architecture. I love walking around looking at buildings. I love interior design. Um, so I could totally imagine if I had my time over again, um, architecture might be a fun place to lay my hat, I reckon. Be good. Okay. And what would you not like to do with your career? what would I not like to do with my career? Or what would I not like to do as a career if I couldn't do what I just said? Both apply, yeah. Well, um, I don't know if it's sort of the same way you are. In the UK, at some stage, maybe when you're sort of like 15, um, you get to do uh, careers guidance. And the careers guidance when I was at school basically meant that you went to see a careers guidance counsellor They'd sit you in front of a computer, you'd um, answer a bunch of kind of almost psychometric tests, like what kind of things do you like to do? Um, and then you get given a result and and, the, and the, the psychometrist says, oh, right, have you considered doing this as a career? And so I went in, and I answered all of my answers and the um, the career guidance I got back was mastic ash felt spreader. I don't know if that means anything to you. But a mastic ash felt spreader is somebody that gets on the top of roofs and like puts melted bitumen on the top of roofs to stop them from from the, the rain from leaking into buildings like hard, dirty, outdoors, smelly, poisonous, like literally the worst um, recommendation I would ever have. Like this is this is to somebody who was studying pure maths, applied maths, further maths and physics um at university uh, so at college so i have no idea why their um their careers guidance um uh sort of program thought that working outside spreading tar on a on a roof would be my cup of tea but i couldn't think anything worse than doing that i have to admit what's your favorite word quote or sentence my favorite word quote or sentence um so when i was younger i used to read um uh, i used to be quite into sort of the concept of taoism i've never been interested in religion but i like taoism as a as a kind of a, a western philosophy and a lot of taoism is communicated through sort of sayings or poems it's not like the bible or the quran or you know um other religious books which are about um often sort of prescriptive you know behaviors or very very detailed stories you know a lot of Taoism is around observing nature and learning lessons from nature and one of the kind of the 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 the, the phrases I like the most which is probably from the 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 Tao Te Ching was um be still as a mountain move like a great river and I guess it's a, a kind of a meditation or a thought on um uh, you know the you know the there's a lot of kind of Taoist sort of symbolism around how water is incredibly soft. You know, it's, um, you know, you can't hold it. You can't, you know, you can't um, 
break it you know it's very fluid it's very supple it's very kind of you know light but um flowing over millennia can kind of ground down the hardest rock and so it's this just juxtaposition between light flowing water but also being incredibly powerful um force over time and at the same time you know stillness is a big part of 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 nature and i think there's something you know really nice about the the symbolism of you know being a still calm kind of powerful but silent kind of sort of uh, a mountain and so i like be still as a mountain move like a great river nice and do you have a least favorite word quarter sentence um i don't know if i've got a least favorite quote i mean there's lots of quotes that are massively overused or misattributed um I mean, a quote that I have used plenty of times, but kind of bugs me when I use it or other people use it, is the the William Gibson quote is, you know, the future is here, not evenly distributed. Mm. Um, I think it's a brilliant quote. I think it's an accurate quote. I just think it's the first quote that any futurist kind of grasps hold of. And so it's a quote that I've heard over and over and over again until I'm kind of sick of it, until it, until it kind of means nothing. So... I don't blame the quote itself, but I blame its over overutilization. If you had to pick one word to describe yourself, what word would you choose? Hmm. Um, that is also quite an interesting question. It, it's an interest, interesting question partly because that's not kind of how my mind thinks. A lot of the time people will say things like, hey, what's your favorite um movie or your favorite color or your favorite food and i don't really think in terms of the binaries like i don't have a favorite x a favorite y or a favorite z um and i think it's probably overly reductive to try and boil somebody's um essence down into a single word and to be completely honest i think actually i would choose a fundamentally different word every single time you ask me based on how i'm feeling that day so in a weird kind of way, I'm going to politely decline answering that question because my brain just can't comprehend what the answer could be. Okay. And final stretch here, number 16, what keeps you up at night? Nothing. I sleep very well. I mean, again, I know it's when people talk about kind of like what keeps you up at night, it's it's like, what's that thing that kind of bugs you that, that, that you know, you wish could be solved in the world? And there's plenty of things there. There's plenty of things that are broken in the world. I think a lot of our politics is broken. I'd love to, if we moved into kind of expert-driven evidence-based politics, um, you know, I, I, you know, so many things, you know, so many things around the world are kind of suboptimal at the moment. But in actual fact, you know, I, I know people that do find themselves up at night worrying about their kids or their future or um, where the next meal is coming from. And I am so fortunate that I don't have those challenges. I'm not super well off by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm also comfortable enough that at the moment I don't have any any kind of existential worries or existential threats. I've got my health at the moment. Um, and so I'm relatively calm and would say that there really isn't anything that keeps me up at night. What's a dream you're chasing? <laughs> I'm again like i'm probably the worst person to to kind of you know maybe to ask some of these questions for because again i don't believe that that it makes sense to kind of chase dreams in a weird kind of way and i don't mean that in a sort of not being ambitious and i don't mean that in a kind of like you know a, a sort of um you know don't follow your dreams but again i think that if if you look at kind of Taoism or buddhism particularly buddhism a lot of buddhism is about being centered. And one of the things about being centered is not to be constantly wishing something was different about your life. You know, oh, everything would be fine if I had the bigger TV or the bigger house or the, you know, the the, the better job. And so I guess I'm not really chasing a particular dream. I'm trying my best to kind of just enjoy where I am now um, because, you know, yeah, I can't can't necessarily do anything about it on the bigger you know bigger more philosophical scale i'd love for you know well peace and happiness i'd love for all of the horrible conflicts in the world 
to 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 disappear and recede. I'd love to have a government that was really truly involved in solving you know people problems and on a more prosaic kind of industry level i would love to see design taken much more seriously um but but yeah there really isn't a a particular dream that i'm i'm chasing or, or 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 um feeling bad about kind of not living that dream at the moment great and you kind of just answered this but what inspires you well i mean to be honest i think other people inspire me um i you know i there are there are lots of people in the world who and in the design industry who do amazing work and i think being exposed to that work and being exposed to people's attitudes around that work um it can be really, really inspiring. And so, yeah, it's 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 probably individuals. And I'm not going to name any particular names because I think there's so many people that that you know I I I have around me who who I admire and who um I um learn a lot from. So I think it's it's yeah, it, it's people, it's it's individuals that you've you know you've maybe got a mental relationship with or who you think are really impressive in some way. Um Oh uh, yeah, I think there's lots of inspirational people out there. Great. And last couple here. Any advice you'd like to share? I mean, and could you be a little bit more specific? Is this a don't eat yellow snow kind of advice? Is this a um, you know, invest in Apple stocks kind of advice? Or I mean, yeah, I I, I it's difficult to kind of give advice when there's not a problem. I think in a weird kind of way, I think this is I'm I'm maybe gonna dodge that question because yeah. I think this is one of the problems we have with the design industry, the tech industry in general. Um, We're so wanting quick fixes. We're so wanting silver bullets. We don't stop to really understand the problem. We don't stop to step back and saying, what advice are you looking for? Like, what's the problem you're facing? Why are you facing this? Um, Why do you think, you know, know, and looking at the problem before saying like how I can help. And so I don't have kind of any, any sort of like broad facing general advice but and also i guess as a coach you're kind of you're encouraged not to give advice but to help people solve those problems which is why i think in a weird kind of way designers make really good coaches because designers are empathetic they're understanding people's needs and they're helping those people solve those problems themselves so unsolicited advice is never much fun you know you're walking around you know you're trying to back your car out or park up your car or you're trying to kind of you know you know, on the street, fix a, you know, fix a window and someone comes along and said, oh, do you want some advice? It's like, no, I don't want some advice now. Um, but if I've got a problem, you know, let's, let's sit down and let's kind of like figure it out together. So, um, yeah, no general undirected advice, I'm afraid. Great. And finally, number 20, how can our listeners keep tabs on you? What's our call to action? Are we looking at your coaching or? Yeah, possibly. I mean, um, I, as I sort of said, I do a bunch of things. Um, if you are a design leader who wants a bit of a co-pilot, um, a lot of the design leaders that I meet, they report into somebody who doesn't come from design, who comes from product, who comes from engineering or a CEO. And they often struggle to um, communicate with them and they often feel that the, there's a lack of understanding. And so if you are a design leader who feels like they need somebody on their side, they need someone to talk to, they need a safe space, they are struggling to raise the profile of design, they're struggling to figure out what they want to do next in their career, they're struggling with all of the the day-to-day management challenges, then please do reach out. Um, Easiest way to get to me is uh, andybud.com, that's my website, Um, or, um, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, Andy Bud, and on Twitter for my sins, Andy Bud. So, you know, you can follow me in those places as well. I'm on threads as well, Andy Bud. Um, if you are a designer who is embarking on a new venture, you're starting to build a new startup and you want to chat with a friendly VC, you know, you've got one now. So you can also reach out to me, you know, through those means that I mentioned um, to talk about, you know, how you go about building a a design business. Um, so those are the two things. Sorry, a, a business as a designer. Um, so those are the kind of the two obvious things that that people you know. If if I can help them, I, I'd be more than happy to. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on today. You know, such a great chance to have someone of your caliber and history to come on the show. I'm so glad to uh, to ask these questions for you. Thanks. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for asking such, um, at times, challenging questions, but I really enjoyed them and I hope your audience did too. Okay, thanks so much.